That makes me think about some of the psalms that were selected to be passed on. The, the David's cries, uh, feeling that his lament. Like I, I find I'm very moved by the laments in Scripture, and uh, certainly that in Job, um, but also David, the, the psalms of David where he's crying out to God, "Where are you?" And yeah. the fact that those passages, like you're saying, like these are the ones that are preserved. Yeah, and there's been a really rich rediscovery um, by Old Testament scholars over the last generation, particularly of the importance of lament. Um, because Christians can sometimes give the impression, well, you know, if we know God and God is real, we've got the answers, we should be happy. <laughs> yeah. And as though somehow then you you shouldn't have problems and pain. And if you do, you're maybe getting it wrong and you're certainly not allowed to vent it or express it. And the Old Testament has no difficulty. There is no doubt that God is sovereign and faithful and trustworthy. And there's equally no doubt that periodically the roof falls in um, and life feels terrible incomprehensible the ways of God just seem utterly baffling and the the honest expression of that is something that you know I think Christians have been sort of relearning um, you know it is okay to grieve to cry out in pain because in a sense it's part of being honest with God instead of oh, well, everything's great really when oh, we know it isn't um, and yeah. you know that it's one of the things people really like about the Old Testament, because in a sense, the New Testament doesn't have those sort of laments and cries of anguish in the same way. I mean, except on the lips of Jesus on the cross. Um, but, you know, on the whole, it doesn't. Um, but when you've got the whole canon of scripture, people often find, hey, you know, if these are model prayers in the Psalms, model prayers for, for others. Um, you know, gosh, maybe it's OK to cry. That's right. And, and those are. To me, those are some of the most um, beautiful passages of scripture, especially when going through traumatic, difficult times, like listening to the voices of the past, lamenting, crying out to God, um, just bearing it all. Like those emotional passages, like speak to me in so many ways. Yeah. Like those are the ones I run to when I'm yeah. when I'm suffering. And that's right. And it's it's just one of those many ways in which it seems to me there's a, a breadth and depth in the Old Testament, you know, without which the New Testament is actually less rich, so to speak. Mm. If one can't, you know, hold both testaments of the Christian canon together. Yeah. And, and certainly like um, the story of Job is another one of those passages where I just feel so terrible or what happens to Job. And whether or not that actually happened in real, I don't know if that actually happened, if it's is it poetry, I don't, I'm not sure, but that that story of Job is another one of those, like, I feel so bad for him. And yet he still is just like trusting in God the entire time. Yeah, I mean, particularly that opening narrative of the book, which I think is fairly clearly a story with a point, you know, because it goes from the guy who's got everything to the guy who's got nothing, or even a kind of minus, because he's still alive. Yeah. It feels so terrible. Um, and yet he refuses to be a fair weather friend. You know, when his wife says, curse God and die. Yeah. Everything's been taken away. And even his own person has been afflicted, you know, from the. That's from right, the boils, family. yeah. And so his wife just says, you know, give up. Curse God and die. And he says, no, shall we receive the good from the hand of God and not receive the bad? Which is, you know, don't be a fair weather friend. Or, I mean, if you know, I spent some time, you know, writing about that, particularly that opening two chapters narrative of the book of Job. I mean, yeah, most of the book of Job is the dialogue of the friends. But, but that opening narrative, what Job goes through you know, he's presented as the model believer at the beginning. Um, and, you know, God commends him to the Satan. who is yeah, not so sure. Um, but what Job goes through in that opening narrative, um, 
is he loses everything and but when he still refuses to give up on God, I mean, in a sense, he's saying that his relationship with God is for better, for worse, for richer, as he was, for poorer, as he now is, in sickness, as he now is, and in health. Mm. I, you know, the, the great words of the marriage vows, which express what, you know, sort of, that's what real relationship is. That's what Job shows. And it's a story, I think, to show how, you know, faith in God can be for God's own sake, as we hope and trust if we marry someone, that, you know, we marry them for their sake, you know, not for what we get from them. You know, that was the Satan suspicion. You know, Job does so well out of believing in God, that he'd be a mug not to. And so, you know, you can say, I love you when you really love someone's bank balance or whatever. But, you know, it's... Can the relationship with God be true in the way that the real marriage is true, where you love and cling to that person? Mm. With um, because it's very easy, particularly with God, you know, to be into God for what we get out of God. And that opening narrative of Job is saying, mm -hmm. you know, it's a suspicion raises the healthy suspicion um, that people can appear to be into God, but actually they're into what they get from God. Mm. And it says, no, no. Um, and then leads into yeah, the the dialogues, which are just very powerful. I, lo I love chatting with you about this, Dr. Marbley, because like you're again, you're like taking us into this mansion and like, ex like look at all these themes that are there. Look how yeah. many ways you can like, bringing this in to so many different areas of life. And it just shows like why these passages, the, why these books were like passed on from generation to generation. Like this is an important work, like pass this on. Yeah. I mean, it's why I'm so grateful for my job at Durham. You know, they, they pay me money to do what I most enjoy doing, studying this material and then trying to communicate to others who, you know, initially find it when it's all a bit strange and alien, no, no, you know, the big enduring issues of life and God, they're all here. Um, but one needs, you know, some patience, I suppose, in learning to tune in, picking up some of the ancient conventions in the way material is written. Um, though, though some of the things I think that are striking about the Old Testament is that in many ways it anticipates the convention of the modern movie. Mm. Um, you know, how do you make something dramatic? You have good dialogue all the way. You know, modern historians don't like that because you know history <laughs> doesn't have dialogue unless you've actually got quotes <laughs> that you know, someone noted down at the time. But no, no, the Old Testament it's always dramatized, um, and it's always in the language of the target audience. I mean, we take that for granted when we read it in English. Um, of course, it's all in Hebrew originally, but, um, you know, when the Pharaoh's daughter um, pulls Moses out of, out of the river, um, she makes a pun in good biblical Hebrew. I'll call him Moshe in Hebrew because I've marshaled him out of the water. Mm. The Hebrew word Masha means to draw out and Moshe is his name. Uh, I'll call him Moshe because I marshaled him. Now, it's a pun in Hebrew. Now, What's, it, what's the Pharaoh's daughter doing speaking in good biblical Hebrew? And I mean, you know, the rabbi suggested, well, maybe, you know, she was so impressed by the Israelites, you know, she was sort of taking study classes in learning their language or whatever. Um, but, you know, the likelihood is it's because the whole thing is written in the language of the target audience, which is Hebrew speakers in the first instance. I mean, um, and... And it's also actually, I mean, that particular example is a good, I think, illustration of how the text's concerns aren't necessarily those of the modern historian. Because the modern historian often gets excited that the name Moses looks like an Egyptian name. Um, you get Ram Moses, but Mos, and that Moses, Mos, that's like the hmm. Moses name. So it's got to say, oh, oh, this is exciting. This is a real Egyptian name. You know, so sort of historical authenticity or whatever. Well, OK, but the text itself doesn't give two hoots about that. 
they're interested in the Pharaoh's daughter making a pun in Hebrew. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, again, like, I think what's wonderful is because you have this lens and you have this academic training, um, you can see these things. And um, so I love that you're like, you're sharing these things because um, this is something that I wouldn't get, obviously, but it's funny, like you can like see this and like call it out. And like, actually, the this was actually one of the points here. It's actually having fun, having a little bit of fun in scripture. Yeah. 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 I mean, we tend to be terribly po-faced when we come to scripture. I mean, yeah. I mean, admittedly, scripture isn't greatly humorous. I mean, I think, you know, the book of Jonah has a wonderful dry humor. Um, and, you know, and one or two other passages have a slight sort of gallows humor, you know, that, that, that Jews down the centuries have often done rather well, <laughs> a certain kind of gallows humor. Um, but nonetheless, there are things that I think, I think I mentioned earlier, that if, if we don't understand the conventions of ancient writing, we can handle it very woodenly. And I think, I mean, a real danger for readers today is we almost sort of freeze when we come to the Bible. Well, that's what it says. Did it happen like that? Is it true or not? In a way that we would never dream of doing with any of the movies we watch or the books we read. You know, when it comes on the screen a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, we're not sending us out, oh, this is two hours of lies and nonsense. We say, hey, great, latest episode, you know. Yeah, right. It me. Um, we don't have difficulty in our culture in recognising conventions, how stories on the screen or on the page can relate to life in lots of ways and convey truth in lots of ways. Um, and we're often reluctant to allow that the biblical writers might have been similarly flexible in their conventions, their literary conventions and how they tell things. Um, and so the, but did it happen like that? And if it didn't, it's not true. You say, well, oh, give me a break. Um, you, know, you never apply that or almost never apply that criterion to anything in a culture where we know, have some idea of the conventions. I mean, we don't always know the conventions, you know, sometimes novelists or movie makers trick us or you know, lead us up one path and whatever. <laughs> um, um, but one of the things that I suppose I've you know, written on from time to time is just this danger of being terribly wooden mm -hmm. when we come to the Bible. Um, it must have happened like that or it can't have happened like that and so it is true or it isn't true. And I'll say, no, 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 H have you tried to read, I sometimes say to my students, will you please read the Bible with the same imaginative seriousness with which you watch your favourite soap? Now, in a soap, you know these are actors, they're scripts, but if it's well done, you're not telling yourself, oh, these are actors and these are scripts. You get into the world and you say, what's going on? Why does this matter? What are they trying to explore or unpack? Because, you know, I think a lot of our culture does its sort of thinking through the soaps. You know, they're, they're the sort of, yeah, often that's the sort right. of the voices of, of the culture. And we usually have no difficulty, as I say, with sort of imaginatively getting into the soaps. And I'm, I'm not saying that the biblical writers are simply doing what the soaps are doing. But I'm saying, please read the biblical writers with the same imaginative seriousness get into mm. the story that you show elsewhere um because you might be pleasantly surprised yeah i mean i think that's the the temptation sometimes is to be looking at that looking at the bible through that lens of did it happen or does it it did not happen is this accurate is it not accurate throw out these books that don't make sense to me jonah obviously a fish tale right but you're saying you're saying like, actually, don't look at it like that. Like, there's something to learn here. Past civilizations have been passing on these books for a reason. There's a story here, and you're like, take this as a serious uh, text to be grappled with. Enjoy it. Uh, try to learn from it. There's so much in that text that I think the problem is sometimes we just want to throw out anything that that seems inaccurate. Yeah. 
and to recognize that literature and biblical writings can express truth in many ways and not least i mean the truth of god you know is so big it resists you know sort of neat packaging um which is one reason why one needs lots of different voices you know why there's four gospels you know jesus is so so rich you no one angle <laughs> will suffice so to speak um and i mean i mean in a sense it's a very small example but one, one of the you know, people often say the Bible's full of contradictions, as a you know, just sort of clatter of contradictory voices, so you can't take it seriously. But I mean, one of the most explicit contradictions um, is in Proverbs 26, uh, verses four and five. Proverbs 26, four: Do not answer fools according to their folly, or you'll be a fool yourself. Verse five: Answer fools according to their folly. Or they'll be wise in their own eyes. <laughs> Don't answer fools, answer fools. But of course, they clearly belong together because it, they're trying to express when you're dealing with a certain kind of unreasonable person, you're onto a loser. You know, whatever you do, <laughs> 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 you're not going to get anywhere. That's good. <laughs> That's awesome. As we are in the mansion exploring the Bible and just taking our time with it, taking it seriously. Um, any any tools, resources you'd recommend for someone who just wants to read the Bible and maybe they don't have the resources to go to a seminary or to have access to certain types of books. Um, I love your library, by the way, uh, back there. Um, <laughs> but like, if, if like- if, if, I really am a scholar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, but I, I think about like, for the for the average person who just wants to understand the Bible better, and like sometimes we come to the Bible and we don't understand the culture. We we want to, but we don't have the time, maybe the luxury to spend with all these different resources. But if we were to if you're to recommend some good like a good tool to help us with understanding the Bible, what would be your recommendation? I'm probably not a good person to ask because in a sense I I. I know too much and I've read too many sort of, you know, sophisticated, erudite, technical things. I'm less good on, you know, but what does the guy on the street actually want? <laughs> yeah. um, I do think the most important thing is actually to read the biblical text itself. Take time, be patient. It's increasingly hard to do that because, you know, there are so many calls on our time and, you know, you, you've got the world in your hand on the phone where you can read anything. So to give time to the Bible because it actually matters doesn't come so readily as it did perhaps to earlier generations who had fewer, you know, competing things. So just taking time to read, to reread, because often as you just spend time, you begin to say, oh, hang on, I think I'm starting to see, you know, just immersing yourself in the material. Um, my sense is also that increasingly there are good study Bibles. For much of history, there, there have been study Bibles. It, it was a, a, an innovation at the Reformation in the 16th century to say, no, 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 we just must have the pure text of Scripture and strip everything else away. In the Middle Ages, uh, both Christians and Jews had very annotated Bibles. Um, and my sense is that those annotated Bibles or study Bibles are coming back in precisely because people need help. And it was always recognized that people needed help. And so they, in the Reformation, there, you know, because there was such a, a rediscovery of the, the living reality and importance of the word that, you know, all the, the commentaries were stripped away. But I think we're rediscovering, no, no, we do need that help. Now, in a sense, in saying that, I'm just playing your question back to you. Um, mm -hmm. but, it, but it's a way of saying that I think study Bibles, and there's many different study Bibles, um, can be a good way. So instead, rather than reading a book about the Bible, you've got a, a something where you're reading the Bible, but you've got some notes, boxes in the margin or whatever, that if they've done their job decently, would help. 
Um, and, you know, those you can try one or two, so to speak. I mean, I've, I've like, oh, that's, oh, ain't that telling me things I don't want to know? Or others, oh, yeah, I really like it. <laughs> and um, when approaching the Old Testament, do you have recommendations on, like, what books to maybe read first or to focus on? I mean, to someone who'd never read the Old Testament at all, I, I would be very tempted to say start with the books of Ruth and Jonah. They're short and they're wonderful. Then I've been trying to say read the book of Genesis. You know, I mean, the controversies around the earlier chapters of Genesis are extensive and somewhat over over cooked i think but in a sense just try and get some sense because i think often if you just read it you may get a sense of the the majesty of the vision and maybe a recognition you, in a sense if you can let the text speak that this really isn't trying to do what the modern scientist is trying to do in you know to give the account of the development of the world, life on the world, and so on. It's a different kind of vision of the world as God's world and of our place within it. And the stories of the the ancestors of Israel, I find profoundly moving. Um, you know, there's a sense that there's something very ancient here, and yet still able to speak deeply. And the Psalms, you know, dip, dip, dip the Psalms, you know, in the some are easier than others, but the Psalms are prayers that, you know, as we've already touched on, you know, at times they let it all hang out. Um, but also the Psalms, as it were, have given believers words when we felt, what can I say? I, I, I can't come up with the words, for at least some occasions, the Psalms have given words that we can make our own. If we want to sort of stammer something to God in prayer, you know, the psalmist can, can help with that. So, again, I think the psalms can be a good uh, way into um, the Old Testament, though, you know, probably not just reading through. But, you know, people can start with the 23rd Psalm and look back, look forward. You know, they look back, Psalm 22, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, have maybe heard that somewhere. Um, or, all, all of which is a way of saying, I mean, I, you know, I, I have wonderful colleagues who write accessible books on the Old Testament in a way that I don't, you know, for um, ordinary folk. I mean, someone like Ellen Davis at Duke um, writes wonderful, uh, much more accessible things on the Old Testament than I do. I'm, I'm much more trying to write for scholars, you know, for Christians who are having to, who are doing theology because they're interested or because they're training for ordination and are facing the scholarly questions of how can I, you know, as it were, hold scholarship and faith together, um, which isn't the question of most people on the street. Um, you know, their questions are usually much more <laughs> pressing, you know, what should I hope for, what should I do, those kinds of things. And I think, you know, scripture will speak to that, but one has to learn, as it were, to, to go through quite a lot of scholarly stuff. And um, I mean, Paul Ricoeur had the wonderful phrase of a second naivete. Um, that in life we start with a first naivete, where we sort of take everything at face value and everything else gets great. And then as we grow up, and you know, particularly in our teens, we realise, hang on, um, <laughs> life ain't like that, and faith ain't like that. <laughs> You know, my prayers aren't getting answered and <laughs> terrible things are happening and God doesn't need to do anything about it. And, you know, what do we do? And people often give up on faith at that point. Instead of staying with it and moving on to what Paul Ricoeur called a second naivete, where one can, as it were, downwind of recognizing and taking seriously the many difficulties that the study of the Bible or the life of faith or whatever has. Um, nonetheless, one can recover the things that matter most and that are in themselves, you know, very simple. Trust, hope, love, you know, goodness, mercy, justice, you know, <laughs> 
Um, yes. That's or, right. Sorry, just while I'm, I'm wittering, but I mean, I think a very good account of what theology is all about um, is T.S. Eliot at the end of Little Giddy. We shall not cease from exploration. We've got to go out there and explore. Bloody learn. And the end of all our exploring will be to return to the place where we started and to know it for the first time. That's beautiful. I love that that idea of like returning to that simplicity yeah. um, that we had when we were young. Of back when we believed everything we read uh, as as hundred percent accurate, and then and then <laughs> but then but, but, but then the the sense of like you said, like the love, the justice. How do we love each other? Like at the end of the day. The whole point of all this, the whole point of all this study is hopefully to make us better people, to make us more loving, more compassionate, have more empathy. Like that's that's the point of all of this, hopefully. Yeah. And and to have a hope, you know, not least yeah. when things are going badly, you know, when there's a global pandemic and people we love are dying. Yeah. You know, for no good reason. Um, you know, that that's, you know, why faith in God matters. And so. You know, my hope and prayer, you know, for myself and for others is that I say, therefore, one can learn from scholarly study. You know, the questions are legit, um, but not get so bogged that one can't, as it were, move on through, not to cease to ask hard questions, but, as I say, to regain something that can easily get lost but which is therefore more deeply rooted. Well, Dr. Marbley, I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast to help us explore the mansion that is scripture and sharing with us your perspective, your insights over the years on kind of holding mystery, holding contradictions, holding um, all of this together and to be able to find the beauty that's there. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that with us. And I want to encourage everyone to check out Dr. Moberly's brand new book called The God of the Old Testament, Encountering the Divine in Christian Scripture. Uh, Dr. Moberly, do you want to say anything about your latest book that just came out? Not really, but uh, it's been really good to talk with you, Mike. Uh, a real joy. Thank you for inviting me. Hey, thank you so much for checking out this video clip from the Dogato podcast. To get more videos like this, simply subscribe here on YouTube. You can also download the full episode of each show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or your favorite podcast player. Take care.